This video is sponsored by Classic Football Shirts, the best place to get your classic and vintage football shirts. To get cheap retro palace shirts, click the link in the description below. Hello and welcome to the e Crystal Palace podcast. I'm Alfonso Greenbrook and in today's podcast I'll be looking over the result against Newcastle by bringing you my match review player rankings and my man match. As well as this, I'm also going to bring you an exclusive interview with Roy Hodgson, Andros Townsend and Joe Ward after the game. So let's begin. Mikel Marina header five minutes from time proved to be crucial as Palace fell to an undeserved defeat to Newcastle United at St James's Park. A quiet encounter looked to be heading for a goalless conclusion until the German midfielder netted his first goal in English football by converting from a corner and cruelly denying the Eagles what would have been a well-deserved and hard-earned point. Boosted by their win against Chelsea a week ago, Palace looked the better side during an edgy first half which saw little goalmouth action. Although, like against the Blues, the unorthodox strike partnership of Wilfred Zaha and Andrew Townsend's pace caused the home defence problems throughout the opening 45 minutes. However, shots on goal were few and far between early on, with the first attempt seeing Zaha passing tamely at Rob Elliott from a tight angle in 23 minutes. But then not long after, Geoffrey Slup miscued and Matt Ritchie saw a goal-bound effort cruelly strike Mamadou Sacco and deflect wide as the game began to bubble. Things then boiled over when a strong challenge from Johan Kabayon Yedlin saw a number of players from both sides get involved in some argy-bargy, for which the Frenchman was booked. But that helped bring the game into life and United went close to breaking the deadlock when Christian Atsu shrugged off Joe Ward and got into the box before blasting into the side netting. It was then rippled at the other end when Townsend and Zaha combined to give the latter a sniff of goal as he peeled away at the back post but headed wide of the mark. However, Hodgson would have been pleased with what he had seen from his side in the first half as they made their way back to the changing rooms at the break. Once again there was a lack of action straight after the kickoff as conditions worsened and the rain fell. But despite being jeered in his first return to St James's Park since his departure to Palace, Townsend continued to look dangerous and bent a shot over Elliot's crossbar just after the hour mark. The visitors had quietened the 52,000 in attendance, but as the half progressed Newcastle began to create more chances and Julian Sproni was called into action twice within 60 seconds when he dived to catch a curling Mohamed Diame shot and then fisted away a fizzling John Doe Shelby pile driver which swerved through the air in the blustery conditions. The game remained on a knife edge and Palace nearly snatched the opener with 10 minutes remaining when Slup slipped in Rubel off his cheek and he sent a cross shot towards the back post that looked set to be converted by Patrick Renano but the Dutchman failed to make contact by the length of a stud. And that miss proved costly as five minutes later the Magpies took the lead. Richie fired a corner into the box which was raced onto by the substitute Marino and he got up above James McArthur to head past Speroni and ensure that the Eagles returned to South London without the point they deserved. It won't go down as the classic, but the history books will show that Crystal Palace lost that 1-0 against Newcastle United despite an organised and hard-working display, where it looked like Palace would be heading for a deserved point. Ultimately, the 90 minutes is unlikely to live long in the memory for many Newcastle or Palace fans alike. But what do we learn from the game? Here are five things. Number 1. Kabai Bai Crystal Palace's French midfielder was making a return to Newcastle United, having shone there during his time in the North East with the Magpies but he could have been sent off for a poor challenge on the Yedlin in the first half, with the 31-year-old's rash challenge sparking angry reactions from the Newcastle players. The Newcastle man was lucky not to be injured and Kabai was probably fortunate not to see red, with referee Stuart Atwell cautioning the Frenchman instead. Newcastle supporters were screaming for a red card and the pundits on match of the day suggested that he could have been dismissed. Number 2. Picking the Positives Despite the defeat, Roy Hodgson was positive about his side's performance against Newcastle. Indeed, the Eagles looked more organised and worked hard for each other. Each player put in a shift at St James's Park and Palace looked to be heading for a deserved point. But luck was not on their side for the winning goal and Palace will hope to get the rub of the green in future matches. 
However, Hodgson was pleased with his performance and if they show the same work rate and desire, they will surely pick up more positive results. Number 3. There's no place like home for Benitez Newcastle United boss Rafa Benitez has a fine record when it comes to playing against teams managed by coaches who have also managed England. In 21 matches at home against teams managed by a coach who's also managed England, he has never lost, with this being his 17th win to go with 4 draws. Number 4. The wait goes on Crystal Palace haven't had much joy away from home in recent months, since April in fact. The 2-1 victory at Liverpool in April was the last win away from home, and also the last time they scored a goal away from home. Since then, Palace have played 7 games on the road, losing all 7 and failing to score in any of them. That didn't really look like changing at St James's Park either, with Palace failing to register a single shot on target. And number 5, more unwanted history. In failing to score in the game, Crystal Palace equalled the record for the fewest number of goals after 9 top flight games. Palace have only scored twice in 9 games so far this season, a figure only matched by Sheffield Wednesday in 1989-90 season and Everton in 2005-6 season. In addition, Palace have also equalled the record for consecutive away defeats without scoring from the beginning of the season, joining Derby County's 2007-8 team on 5. So now I'm going to move on to the player ratings, but before I start, don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Facebook at Ecrystal Palace for the best place to get all the latest Palace news. And also, if you're on Facebook, do feel free to join our Facebook group, which is a really great place for you to join in with discussions and share your opinions with other fans. And also, like the BBS, like Homesdale.net, it's also a great place for you to share news articles and videos and photos with other fans. So if you are someone who likes to get involved, share your opinion or share your videos with other fans, then do join our Facebook group. Now another great place to share your opinion is in the YouTube comments, so if you are listening to the podcast on YouTube then do feel free to drop a comment below with your player ratings and that is rating the players for 1 to 10 based on how you thought they performed with 10 being the best and 1 being the worst and that's just to give me an idea of how my opinion compares to yours and what you guys thought about the players performances and about the game as a whole and if you don't want to do that then drop any views you have of the game in the comments below because I'm sure that myself looking back at the video other fans who come and listen to the podcast, they also want to see what other fans have to say. So do share your opinion because I'm sure myself, or I know myself would like to read it, but I'm sure there'll be other fans who also like to read your opinion. Now, if you do want to find any of these social media groups and follow us, then all the links will be in the description below. Now we're going to move on to the player ratings, starting in goal with Julian Sproni, who I am going to give a 6. Had little to do over 90 minutes, but made a couple of good saves. Was not at fault for the goal. So Julian Sproni here, I've given him a 6 and much like last week he came into the side and although we did lose the game I thought he had a really good performance and that's why I've given him the 6. But the main thing really to talk about his performance is you may criticise him for the goal and I'll go on to talk about that later but as a game as a whole it was quite a dead game. You know Newcastle rarely attacked Palace although we created chances we weren't really on the attack as much as we would have liked. So actually it was quite a boring game and that resulted in Sproni and also the Newcastle keeper not actually having quite a lot to do and over the 90 minutes he only made one or two saves here and there and admittedly these were saves which Wayne Hennessy probably would not have made maybe because he's not as agile but Speroni made these saves kept us in the game at that point and certainly after he made them a couple of saves towards the end of the game it looked like actually we were going to draw the game Speroni kept us in the game and obviously we went on to concede the goal but if say we didn't concede that goal later on you could put credit to Spiroli for making them saves you know throughout the second half which actually kept us in the game and it's not often with a Palace goalkeeper in the recent seasons where you say this keeper won the game and even if we drew the game you could say actually Spironi was quite key to that because some of the saves he did make and I, I personally like I said in that little summary I don't think he was a thought for the goal and you know just talk about the first half and then talk about the second half didn't really have to do anything in the first half, it was a really quiet half, rarely had any back passes, rarely had any goal kicks, rarely even had to make a save. So in the first half, really, really quiet. In the second half, like I said already, he made a couple of saves, really good saves and catches as well. You know, considering he's quite a lot shorter than Wayne Hennessy, he actually goes and catches the crosses, unlike what Hennessy does. So in terms of, you know, not being smaller, he still makes it seem as if he's bigger. And he can, you know, go forth and claim crosses. Is that something he done really well? And then the third bullet point I put here in my notes is, could he have stopped the goal? You know, that is a question I'm going to ask you guys and comment below. 
Could he have stopped the goal? In my opinion, if you look back at the replay, the corner's come in from Richie. The player's got his head on it. He's headed it down. McArthur, obviously, not being the tallest player, but he managed to get his head on it. And then it deflected off the Newcastle player again. And it went off the top of Spironi. So I think if you look back at the replay, Spironi's obviously on the goal line. He's obviously put his hands up to try and save it. But he's thought that the, the actual deflections come off the Newcastle player's head. But because it rebounded off James McArthur, then on the Newcastle player's head, he couldn't quite get his self positioned right. So if that was Wayne Hennessy, we probably would have crucified him for making that mistake. But when you consider that Spironi is a little bit smaller and the fact that he was quite unlucky because there was a deflection and he didn't know what direction the ball was going to go in, you could, you know, you could forgive him for that. And if you look back at the replay as well, Patrick Vinano, I don't know what he's doing. He's terrible at marking in the box, so I don't know why we leave him there. But also he could be at fault, you could say, because he was also on the goal line. But in terms of the goal, it's a really good delivery from Richie. Unlucky to deflect off McCarthy's head and that sort of put Speroni in the wrong place. So he had literally seconds, even milliseconds to react. And unluckily for us, he didn't quite have enough time to do that. But like I said, you know, do comment below with your opinion. Could Speroni have stopped the goal? And certainly if you ask me, if that was Wayne Hennessy, we probably would be criticising him right now. But because it's Speroni, the legend, we're not going to criticise him too much. But do, you know, comment below with your views. And I personally think, you know, his game was good overall Spironi so I think that sort of overshadowed the goal we conceded but you could say most other goalkeepers even though if they're short they still would have made an attempt to actually try and get the ball away because it did go above his head so maybe he should be you know positioning his hands better but you know I think you know I'm not really of an opinion that it's his fault but then I can also understand that actually Spironi should really be you know, marking his area, but he wasn't quite unlucky with the deflection. But Spironi, he's coming to the side again, and I've given him the six because for the second week we're running, he's coming to the side, he's re reinstalled the confidence in the back line, in the whole team. He communicates with the whole team as a whole, you know, communicating with the defence. He organises the team, and, you know, it's going to be a struggle for Wayne Hennessy. So unless Wayne Hennessy puts in a really, really solid shift against Bristol City in the Cup, I don't see no reason... Why Julian Spironi shouldn't start the pre any Premier League games because what he's shown us in the last two games is his experience. And in this game, once again, he's come in and he didn't really look. He didn't really look like a veteran. He looked like he'd been playing in the Premier League for a few months. Oh yeah, he's been playing in the Premier League for quite a long time. But Julian Spironi, I think a six is a fair result. Moving on now to the right back Joe Ward, who I am going to give a six. Made a couple of important challenges and interceptions. Did little wrong at right, right back with a steady display. So Joe Ward here, I've given him a 6. There isn't really much to say about his performance because, like I said, it was quite a lacklustre performance from the whole team. There was nothing really that exciting throughout the game. But in terms of Joe Ward's performance, you know, he has been rinsed. He has been absolutely criticised. And I've been guilty of it myself this season. I've criticised him quite a lot for his performances. And rightly so, because his performances at the beginning of the season weren't good enough. But in what he showed in this game, following on, following on from that good performance against Chelsea, he put in a really, really good performance again. And you could question, obviously I haven't given him the highest defender rating, but you could argue that maybe he was one of the better defenders on the day. But in terms of what he'd done in the game, loads of important challenges. So getting in from right back, cutting inside, making these challenges, making interceptions. So that's something he didn't do at the beginning of the season. Now he's obviously had weeks to work with Roy. He's now starting to make interceptions, stopping crosses, you know, going in. And although he didn't do anything fantastic, you know, he didn't go forward. He didn't try and attack, you know, try and help us on the counter-attack. But that's because it was quite a steady, dis steady display. And at the end of the day, since Roy Hodgson's come in, he's played Joe Ward in a more defensive role. So instead of doing what past managers have done and make the fullbacks run up and almost be as another winger so they can overlap. He's made sure that Joe Ward stays back in defence, keeping it simple. And, you know, the fact that it's kept simple seems to have improved Joe Ward's performances. So I think he didn't actually do that much wrong. You know, you can't fault him for the goal. You can't fault him for the defensive performance as a whole. I suppose the criticism is the fact that he didn't go forward too much. But I personally find that when he does go forward, he seems to get lost and his positional awareness sort of goes down. So maybe... With him just staying back, keeping his defensive duties simple, seems to have brought the better out of him. But in terms of a note about him, you know, although he's done well in the last two games, I still think Fossi Mensah's a better player. You know, what we've seen from Fossi Mensah is his pace, his physicality, all this stuff that you would want a fullback to have. You know, you want them to be pacey, you want them to have good defending, good physical attributes, and Fossi Mensah has that. And Joe Ward is no, 
you know, no Fossey Mensah. Fossey Mensah's young, quick. Joe Ward, he's relatively young in terms of footballing age. He's not, you know, to his 30s yet, but he's still, you know, starting to decline. So, although Joe Ward isn't Fossey Mensah and he's not quite the same in terms of ability and skill, but I still thought, coming in for Fossey Mensah, I still thought he'd done a, you know, a reasonable job at right back. And I think against Bristol City, Roy Hutchins already said it himself, there's going to be a few changes. So I think the likes of Fossu Mensah, Jara Reedwald, uh, James Tonkins as well, they will come back into the side. And maybe that will give Fossu Mensah a chance to re-establish himself in the right-back role. Because, you know, against Chelsea, he came on as a defensive midfielder. I thought he'd done fantastically well. He almost scored. So that's something that Joe Ward doesn't have that Fossu Mensah offer. So that's another debate for maybe a another weekend. But I personally think Joe Ward, there's no reason for him to be dropped because he had a really alright performance. But I think Fossi Mensah eventually is going to come back into the side because he's got the better attributes. He's got the best, better physicality, better pace, etc. But that's not to put you know anything down on Joe Ward. I thought he'd done a really good performance and that's why I've given him the six. But I still think that Fossi Mensah's got slightly more better attributes to help us going forth this season. But a good performance from Joe Ward and like I said, you could question whether he was the best defender on the day. Now to move on to the centre-back and captain, Scott Dan, who I am going to give a 7. A no-nonsense display from the kipper at the heart of the Palace defence. So Scott Dan here, I've given him a 7, and much like last week against Chelsea, there's not really much to say about his performance, because it was just a solid performance from the captain, and I said this last week, it looked like it, he, he looked like his old self. So when he was playing so well in 2015, we were, called, you know, we were saying he should be called up to England. And in this game, although he wasn't fantastic, I still thought... Like the word I used was no nonsense. So he'd done everything right defensively. Was really solid. And although he is the captain, you know, last season that seemed to down his performances. I think he's slightly better. Not the best, but he's slightly better at being the captain this season. And it cer cer certainly showed in his performances. Because against Chelsea, he not only captained the side well, but it was a no nonsense display. So he put in tackles. He, you know, put in blocks. He'd done what he could to you know, stop Newcastle, and the fact that we only conceded from a set piece where it was a player that he wasn't marking, you can't really fault him for the goal either, so in terms of an overall performance, I thought he was really good, and the fact that him and Sacco, you know, last season, didn't really ha play, well, they didn't really, not that they didn't play well, but they hardly played next to each other, because Dan was injured, they've come together, and considering Tompkins formed a good partnership, he's been kept out of the team, so Scott Dan and Saka are actually getting a, are building a really good partnership and it did show in this game because of how solid we were in the defence but I've given him a 7 because I thought you know like I said already the Scott down of old so he put in a performance like he's done in the past it was a no nonsense one putting tackles blocks being really really solid and in terms of positional awareness much much better than we were say against Man United Man City a few weeks ago you know there was a few dummies as well on the edge of his own box so the reason I've given him a 7 is a few times he picked up the ball on the edge of our own area, done a few dummies and cleared the ball away. He had a few crossfield passes which some were quite aimless because of the wind and others were quite successful. So in terms of an overall performance, you know, defensively good, you know, going forward, putting long balls, he was alright. So I thought overall a really good performance. So hopefully, you know, we'll see... Uh, against Bristol City, we see James Tompkins come in. If James Tompkins has a fantastic game, then maybe we could play him instead of Scott Dan or play Tompkins at right back. But in terms of this performance, I think Scott Dan certainly does uh, deserve his place in the side. And based based on what we've seen already this season, you know, Punchin's performances and Dan's performances, I personally can say most people would probably agree that in terms of the captaincy, I think Scott Dan's done a better job than punching this season so I think in that respect if we have to pick someone who's the captain who always has to play then maybe Scott Dan is the man to do so but a seven for him a really good performance and unlucky to to concede the goal late on. Now to move on to his centre back partner Mamadou Sako who I am going to give a six. Took a few risks on the ball but made some good blocks and challenges and was calm under pressure. So Mamadou Sako here we know what to expect from him now and against Chelsea he was really immense and I gave him a really high rating and once again, you know, yes, he took a few risks on the ball against Newcastle, but I thought, much like Dan, he put a really solid, sort of robust defensive performance. And we know from Sacco his trademark blocks and tackles. He'd done that once again in this game. But the thing I really like about his, his performances is, is that this was quite a crucial game. You know, we hadn't, obviously, we beat Chelsea, but we needed to beat a 
you know, a team who should be realistically around us. So someone like Newcastle, newly promoted, there's a lot of pressure on us to win that game, which ultimately we didn't. But in terms of Saka's performance, he's one of these players who always keeps calm under pressure. So from the fir from the first minute, he was very calm on the ball, you know, would carry the ball forward, wouldn't misplace a pass or very rarely misplace the pass. If there was nothing going forward, he'd pass it back to the goalkeeper. They had that communication. So in terms of his performance, I thought it was really, really good. You know, defensively making blocks and tackles. And in terms of just overall gameplay, he was really calm under pressure. A word I sort of use, and I've seen a lot of people, including Jim, J Jim Daly use, is uncompromising. So I suppose that's a good word to describe his performance. You know, another thing really... You could say his performance is uncompromising, but another thing is headers. So quite a lot of the time, Newcastle were putting in balls, you know, the likes of Ritchie and, uh, Ritchie and Atsu, they were putting balls into the box and Saka was there to head them all day long. And it's quite understandable, you know, with Saka being quite a big uh, a big man, being such a beast in the ball, whenever a ball comes into the box, he head it wide. So in terms of his performance, good blocks, good challenges and headers away and much like what I said with Dan you can't really fault him for the goal we conceded because he wasn't the man marking James McArthur so in terms of his performance I personally think looking back at the game yes he took a few risks on the ball you know by carrying it forward when there was no one back but in terms of an overall performance I think he did deserve to at least get a point from the game because I thought that when you've got a player or when you're in a game that's you're under so much pressure if you've got a player who can keep calm and do his job right, which Sacco and Dan did, they need to at least deserve something from the game. And you probably heard that in the five things we learned. It's the fact that we did deserve to at least draw the game, but ultimately we didn't. But Sacco, once again, not the best performance, not a vintage Sacco performance, but certainly one up there where it was a really solid performance from the whole team. So now I'm going to move on to the left back, Pacha Finano, who I am going to give a five. Tried to get fooled, but failed to have a positive impact. Was also booked. So Patrick Van Arnold here, I've given him a 5 and much like what I've seen on social media, quite a lot of people have been criticising him and I think rightly so because it wasn't only a poor performance offensively which we know is his biggest attribute but also defensively because you know the rest of the defence were having such a good game it's quite disappointing that actually Van Arnold didn't quite have as much impact as he would have liked defensively. You know he failed to have a positive impact, he's normally one of these flair players who can hit teams on the counter-attack, put a cross in or, you know, come back and use his pace to defend. But in this game, we didn't really quite see it. And, you know, we did know that when, when we signed him from Sunderland, they said he's not the best defender, he would always just go forward. And we've seen in spells, he's actually proved them wrong by being really good defensively. But in this game, this is more of one of the games that the, the Sunderland fans did explain in the fact that he wasn't very good defensively. Or offensively and I think the word we could use is vintage so it wasn't a vintage game in terms of his performance because we know in terms of what he always does is bombing up and down that left hand side and also getting back and using his pace to defend even though he may not be the best at defending but in this game it wasn't vintage didn't do that and to be honest he could have even scored the game and that's what's even more frustratingly frustrating is the fact that yes he had a poor game but he could have redeemed himself by getting the winning goal and you know Ruben Loftus-Cheek, we were debating whether he had to start. He came off the bench, had a really good impact. You know, he dribbled past a few players, put a ball in the box, which you could argue that he should have scored with himself, you know, shooting that or kicking that in the bottom corner. He didn't decide to shoot. He crossed it across the face of goal. And Patrick Van Arnold here, people have criticised him for missing the open goal. But if you watched goals on Sunday, if you listened to pundits, if you watched the highlights yourself, the ball was literally inches away from him. So it wasn't the fact that he wasn't running onto it fast enough or he wasn't positioned right. It was just the fact that the ball was there and he couldn't quite get to it quick enough. And if he had been a few inches further forward, that would have been an easy tap in. And unlike Chelsea, I think that his feet were in the right position for him to score that open goal. So in terms of his performance, I've given him a five because he was really, really poor defensively. And he probably would have got a six if he had scored that goal late on. But once again, Vanano, you know, there's arguments about whether he's actually any good at defending. I personally think, looking back at the Chelsea game, I thought he played really well defensively, you know, as well as going forward. And I thought Jeffrey Slup on that left-hand side complimented him really well. But we're now starting to see in dribs and drabs that actually he's having some really, really poor games defensively. And, you know, just to talk about the goal we conceded, I talked about it with Spironi. The ball, obviously, it was quite unlucky. It got deflected off MacArthur's head. But then... Van Aanholt was also on the line next to Spironi, so Van Aanholt either should have come off the line to head that away 
or at least tried to block it off the line, which neither of them he did. So not a vintage performance from Fernando, a very disappointing performance, and hopefully he can prove us wrong because I've we've seen the quality he's got, especially the Middlesbrough game last year, but now we need to see it more often, more frequently, his solid performances, because we know he's a good defender, that's why Big Sam signed him, but like what Big Sam did, you need to get the best out of him, and certainly in this game, we didn't quite see that there, but a 5 for him, I think, is a fair result. Now moving on to the defensive midfielder, Luka Milivojevic, who I am going to give a 7. Made some good interceptions in midfield and helped to frustrate the home side for large periods. So Milivojevic here, I've given him a 7, and I thought he had a really, really good performance. And in terms of losing the game, when you do lose a game, you know, you try to look for positives. And one of the p positives for me was actually the performance of the whole team, and in particular Milivojevic. You know, in terms of a game, I always believe that a game is either lost or won in midfield and I personally thought that Milivojevic he bossed the midfield you know we know how good he is we know how physical he he can be how good his defensive attributes are and in this game all of them things came to light you know in terms of playing in that, in that defensive midfield role he's in he was making interceptions everywhere he was frustrating the home side by not allowing them any pass or any chances to create passages of play so in terms of his defensive performance it was really great but the other reason I've given him a 7 is sometimes offensively he'd actually pick up the ball from deep and much like what Ruben Loftus-Cheek does, he'd pick it up and put a lovely crossfield ball. So instead of a defender just hoofing it up, you've got someone like Milivojevic who can just more accurately put a pass, a crossfield pass and there was a few times where he'd done that throughout the game and that's what you want. You know when you've got a game as boring as this one was where both teams are even until one team scores let's say a lucky goal because it was the deflection made it unlucky but let's say you score that goal you know when you've got a player playing so well you know it's going to really affect the, the way he performs Milivojevic you know he tried to get something out of a dull game he was one of the bright sparks that say you know when you're in a boring game you can't really get anything from it you need someone to create something and maybe he was the different he was one of the better players in the game and I'll go on to talk about the man and match sec section later on there isn't quite a lot of players I could put in that short list but I'll tell you now, he was one of them because I thought his defensive performance and his, in terms of his midfield playing, frustrating the home side, that sort of performance was really well. And if you wanted to sum his performance up and why I've given him a 7, it's really that he just bosses the centre of play. So he's playing in a very central role and he just puts blows everyone out of the war. He's the main man there and plays really well in that position. But in terms of performance as a whole, a 7 for him, really fair result. Great defensive performance again great at creating passages or play by spreading the ball out wide and we could debate whether a play against um, Bristol City even if he doesn't even if he gets a rest or even if he comes off the bench I think that he could we could get a chance to experiment because I thought in the last EFL Cup game I thought he played really well with Reed Award so if he can play against Bristol City who are theoretically a worse side they're meant to be a worse side if we can experiment by putting Reed Award and Milivojevic maybe that partnership we could try out because I certainly think that if you can get both of them players who are both relatively young if you can get both of them on top form that could turn out to be a really good solid partnership but Milivojevic here I think a7 is a fair result moving on now to his defensive partner and that is Johan Kabai who I am going to give a6 booked for a poor challenge on Adrian Yedlin when he could have seen red was involved in some neat play otherwise in the midfield so Johan Kabai here is his, is his second return, I believe, to Newcastle since leaving for PSG and then returning to Palace. And I thought he had a reasonably good game. And like I said with Milivojevic, a game is won and lost in the midfield. And I personally thought Kabai and Milivojevic, them two playing in the midfield, done a really, really good job of actually winning that battle and keeping control of the game. But in terms of his performance, he was booed with every touch. And I personally think that could normally affect the player's performance. In Kabai's case, it didn't really affect him. He didn't really seem to care about getting booed from every time he touched the ball. And there were actually a few times as well where he laughed. So he went to take a corner. All the fans were booing him, you know, swearing at him. And he just laughed. He just, you know, got on with it. So that's a good thing in terms of character. The fact that you can ignore criticism and ignore boos from the fans to carry on. That was great. And, you know, there was a few times in the midfield where there was a few neat passes. So he was playing slightly further forward than Milivojevic. But, you know, when he went forward by on the rare occasion, he had helped to pass the ball out wide, you know, set up the counter-attack. And also, he was quite good because we haven't got a physical presence up front. He was re reasonably good as well at keeping the ball up and, you know, trying to 
wait for the pressure to go before playing on. So in terms of his, you know, overall attacking play, I thought it was really good. But the main thing really about his performance, and the reason I can't give him a 7 for his performance, is purely because of the challenge on Yedlin. Now there's been a lot of debate, you know, people have come out and said, that's a definite red. People have said it on match of the day, that's a definite red. I personally, first seeing that, I thought, you're really, really lucky not to get a red there. But if you look back at it, I'm not being biased, but even Yedlin came out himself and said he was really apologetic Kabai. He, uh, Kabai apologised. Yedlin said, you know, at the end of the day, it was just a clumsy challenge. Nothing really that much in it. And to be honest, if a player comes out and says that, you just got to put your hands up and say, biased or biased or not biased, you know, that was just a poor challenge, mistimed, but it's not a red. And in terms of, if you look back at the replay, yes, he's gone diving into the challenge, but it's not a studs up challenge, which would normally be a red. So his studs are down. And also one of his other leg, his right hand leg was trailing. So it wasn't a two fitted challenge, which would, would, would be a red. So actually it was just a really mistimed, bad challenge where he miscued one of his feet. The other one was dragging. So it was just a one footed studs down challenge. Not really. You could see a red for that in other days. But if you look back at it really closely, and if you listen to what the player said himself, he, he said, Kabai was apologetic. He wasn't on purpose. It was just a mistake. You know, it's definitely not a red. But I personally, I don't know, maybe it depends on the situation and the context. But if that happened to, let's say, uh, let's say Scott Dan was on the end of one of them challenges. Someone's come in and, you know, clattered Scott Dan. You probably would be calling for red. But if if it's like this instance where the player's gone in, slightly misjudged it, then maybe you could allow it not to be a red. And I personally think, and so did the people on Holmes and Radio who, you know, I did listen to what they thought and they said, yeah, it could have been a red. But at the end of the day, his leg was trailing. He didn't actually go in two-footed. It wasn't off the ground. So it was just a clumsy challenge. Could see a red, but ultimately was a yellow. But other than that, I thought his performance was really good. Obviously, we know he's got sort of this thing now where Kabai likes to make a challenge, likes to get involved. That's all great, but he's now going to try and be careful because he can't keep getting yellow cards every game because eventually he's going to be suspended for one game, two games, if he keeps getting these cards. But like I've said already, a good defensive performance. You know, lucky not to be sent off, but in terms of offensive play, really good at getting forward. And I personally think a six is a fair result. And if you do want to comment below whether you think it was a red card or not, do feel free and obviously I will have some deb debate with you uh, about, you know, just to sort of justify your opinion. Just have a little bit of debate because like I said at the beginning of the podcast, I do like to listen to your fans, other fans opinions. So if you do want to comment below with your thoughts on whether that should have been a red card, then do feel free to do so. Now I'm going to move on to Jeffrey Slup, who I am going to give a 5. Worked hard and tried to get forward in support of Wilfred Zaha in the first half, but had little influence in the second. So Jeffrey Slup here, I've given him a 5, much like the, quite a lot of the things I said about Van Arnold, it was a really disappointing performance in the fact that he wasn't only basically worthless in defence because he didn't really have any influence there, but also going forward, although he did try to help Wilfred Zaha, he was quite muted, let's say, in terms of his offensive play, you know. If you look back at the game, it's not quite, we're not quite sure where exactly he was playing because we know he's normally a left back, but in the last few games he's been playing sort of a, a centre back, sorry, a centre defensive mid role, so playing in that defensive role. In this game, he was playing slightly more further wide, so it's not exactly, we're not quite sure where exactly he was playing, but let's say in this game, he was playing out wide. I don't think really he played really well there, you know, I talked about it already with Van Arnold, but we know the quality he's got in terms of his pace and his ability to create chances and hit teams in the break, but in this game, didn't really do that and although he did work hard so unlike Van Arnold, he actually tried it looked like to us the fans watching that he at least tried to get something in the game and tried to go forward and tried to help Zaha but to be honest he just had no influence on the game and maybe that's because he's he's not got a proper position so the fact that he's sort of playing a sweeper role drifting roles maybe that affected his game and the fact that he didn't know you know he doesn't know exactly where he has to be and although he did look all right there so whatever his role is whether it's a sweeper or someone playing defensive mid whatever his role is he seems to be doing all right there and he did keep lofty cheek out of the team so he must be doing something right but in terms of his performance it was a very disappointing one and I keep mentioning it with a few players you know when it's such a boring game you need players to have a little bit of spark a little bit of magic to try and get something out of the game and unluckily for us Slup wasn't quite on his game and you know in terms of what he was meant to give to the team 
we didn't really quite have see a lot of influence from himself in the game. But a 5 for Jeffrey Slup, I think, is a fair result. Now to move on to James MacArthur, who I am going to give a 6. Nothing spectacular in the middle, but was a combative and helped to break up the play. So James MacArthur here, I've given him a 6. And much like what we you know, expect from James MacArthur, he's a very consistent player when he's not injured. And on his day, he can be a really, really good player. And in this game, you know, I said the game was boring and that the game is won in the midfield. I thought that MacArthur did nothing spectacular in the midfield, but he'd done his job. So in terms of winning that midfield battle, he'd done a really good job of keeping the ball, setting up attacks, you know, defending well as well, so drifting back. So I thought in terms of that, that was fantastic. And the word you could use is combative. So the fact that he was working hard in the game, trying to get what he could for the team, and also breaking up the play. So I mentioned it already, but in terms of going back and defending, helping Milivojevic and Kabai, so he'd drift back, help break up the play, help break up the Newcastle attack. And when you consider neither Palace or Newcastle had any proper attacks other than the, other than the goal, you could say it's quite an even game. Both teams were clashing. And, you know, that's probably because of both MacArthur and the Newcastle midfield were playing so well at breaking each other's play play up. But in terms of the six, just to go through why I've given it to him, obviously it was a really quiet game, so it wasn't a spectacular performance from him, but he'd done what he had to do. You know, he worked hard on the ball and yes he worked hard on the ball but then he, he that was only a few times so when he did get the ball he made good use of it but he didn't really see much of the ball and that's why he wasn't that spectacular is the fact that he got the ball a few times but he didn't have so much ball so much of the ball to actually make a real impact on the team and say if we did get the ball to him more often he can make these lovely runs forward and then put the ball out wide so if he hadn't been you know, having not a lot of the ball, maybe he could have had a bigger influence on the game. But in terms of his performance, I think a six is a fair result because although nothing was spectacular in the game, he'd done his job. He was there what he had. He was there and he'd done his job what he was meant to. He was combative and also, once again, did help up to break up the play. Now to move on to our front two of Andros Townsend and Wilfried Zaha, starting with Andros Townsend, who I am going to give a seven. Received booze from the Newcastle faithful, but tried to make things happen for Palace even if he lacked a final telling pass or shot. So Andros Townsend here, considering how well him and Zaha played up front against Chelsea, we came into this game against Newcastle, obviously not having any proper attacking threats, but we thought we might have a chance. We had an expectation that actually this front three could use their, or this front two could use their pace to our advantage and actually cause Newcastle quite a lot of problems. And when you consider that Newcastle fans, much like what they were doing to Kabai, they kept booing Andros Townsend because obviously he left them when they got relegated. They were booing him quite a lot, but much like Kabai, Andros Townsend uses character to actually put that beside and actually not let that affect his performance on the field. And in terms of his performance, I've given him a seven and I thought he was probably one of the better players for Palace. You know, in terms of our offensive play, he was the guy who tried to make things happen. So he was the guy running up and down the wings, trying to put crosses in. But ultimately, you can put in as many crosses as you like into a box. But if you haven't got anyone in there that we didn't have because Zaha was playing out wide as well, because we had no one there to attack the ball, Andros Townsend's efforts in, in that were great in terms of getting the ball into the box, but because there was no one there, them chances were wasted throughout the time. And even though he did do that and he did look, he did play hard, tried to get what he could for the team, he still lacked that sort of finding, final telling pass. So there may have been a few chances where instead of putting a cross in, he could have cut inside and then passed it to Zaha or someone else. And they could have created a chance as opposed to just pumping it and lofting it into the box. And also a shot as well. You know, we know how good he is at shooting on his day, you know. Obviously, we don't want him always cutting inside and having shots. But in a game where Newcastle were defending really well, the other two, Palace are playing well as well. You're sort of nulling each other out. You're not really having any much impact. You're both equal. Then that's the sort of game where you need a bit of magic. So maybe in this game, because we had no one in the box to cross to, maybe Townsend, because there was no support, maybe he should, should have just tried his luck. And I'm sure there would have been a few occasions where if instead of just crossing the ball into the box, if he had stopped... Maybe cut inside, jinked past a few players. If he had done that, I'm sure there would have been one or two chances where he could have had a shot and actually had that end product to actually get us or help us to get something for, from the game. And he did have a few decent shots. So although I'm saying he should have shot more, there was a few chances, but majority of them weren't really worthy of note. And it is it still is a shame that he didn't score because he at least even though he didn't have the best goal scoring opportunities. 
at least he showed attacking intent and at least he put in the effort or it looked like to us the fans watching that he at least tried to get something from the game but to be honest in terms of his performance once again like I've said attacking intent was good and in terms of when we were under pressure chasing the game and even before that before they scored he would still go back and do his defensive works and that's why I've given him a 7 and when like I said at the beginning the point I touched on when you consider that every touch he had of the ball was booed it didn't affect him it seemed to spur him on so the more they booed him the more that helped him to improve throughout the game and we did see that you know as soon as he had his first touch there was a massive wave of boos around the stadium and that seemed to from there on in improve and propel his performances going forward but in terms of his performance obviously it's not ideal having him and Zaha up front and although they looked all right against Chelsea I thought that they drifted too much in this game so instead of playing down the middle and having that free roll which saw them do so well against Chelsea because they were playing more out wide and because there was no one in the box their sort of attacking intent and using their pace to their advantage didn't really come to anything in this game but a 7 for him I think is a fair result. Now to move on to his fellow striker and the final player in our starting 11 and that is Wilfred Zaha who I am going to give a 6. Not his best game, tried hard in the first half but had a good chance but missed a good chance with a header and faded in the second before being substituted. So Wilfred Zaha here I've given him a 6 and you know when we consider how well he was playing against Chelsea last weekend and the fact that I believe I gave him a 9. When you consider he put in a, such a good performance like that, considering he was only half fit, you would expect having a week's training being even more fit, say say 80% fit, you would expect him to play even better. But like I said with Townsend, it's not ideal playing with these two up front and it did show in this game because it didn't because he was playing up front and because he was drifting out wide too much he didn't really get to utilize his skill that much in the game and that's not to take away his effort because I thought especially in the first half he tried hard so he tried to make things happen but because he was drifting too much and because there was no one in the box he didn't really have that much influence and there was a really good chance we know he's not the best at headering and he he even said that himself in an interview a few weeks ago and other than the goal he scored against Brighton in the playoff playoff semi-final he hasn't really had any headed goals in his career so you can understand even though we haven't got a striker you'd want him to head that head that home but because he isn't the best and because there was a player coming across to him he couldn't quite have that so that was a really good chance if that could if that was Christian Menteke he would have absolutely boshed the Newcastle player out of the way and probably scored from that header but at the end of the day Zaha isn't good at headering you give him a header he missed it was you really expecting him to score no not really but in terms of that, he could try and improve on that in training. So I personally think he probably won't start against Bristol City. He may be on the bench and just to get a little bit more game time after injury. But even if he comes off the bench, maybe he just needs to try and work on his headering. So whether that's being staying behind after training, whether that's just being just sort of putting in crosses into the box and just making sure that he has at least got a little bit of ability when it comes to header, uh, headering. And in terms of the second half, even though he had that missed chance in the first half, in the second half he was even more quieter, didn't really have that much impact and seemed to fade as the game went on. So as soon as we kicked off we saw he, he saw less and less of the ball and then eventually got substituted and people did say why was he being taken off, we needed that bit of spark and I understand why Roy Hodgson took him off because we don't want to you know, get him injured but in that game I would have liked to see someone like Jeffrey Slop who was having a terrible game let him go off, bring in Reed Ward or Loftus Cheek just to solidify that defence and still have that attacking intent from Zaha and I personally would have liked to see that I, I thought that Slop and Kabai were fading towards the end of the game bring Loftus Cheek bring Reed Ward on bring Fossi Mensah on and still leave Zaha on because even when he's not 100% fit or when he's run out of energy he can still create something in the game and that's what I would have liked to see even though he did fade in the game I still would have liked to see him remain on the pitch because it's not only him getting game time, but in terms of his influence, we need him on the pitch for that today. But or for them, uh, you know, against Newcastle that day. But giving him a six, I thought he played all right out wide. You know, he did try to stretch the Newcastle team, which he done relatively well. But if you haven't got a striker to get on the end of them crosses, or or because of that space you've left because you've dragged them wide, it's quite ineffective. And in terms of his performance as a whole, he did okay. It wasn't fantastic, and I could have given him a five. But I still gave him a 6 because he had a few chances. But like I said already, he did do okay in the game. Now I'm going to move on to the subs. Ruben Loftus-Cheek and Bakary Seko. So I'm just going to start with Bakary Seko who I haven't given a rating. And that's purely because he had very little time to make an impact. So he came on 
towards the end of the game when we were searching to get a late goal we were trying to get something obviously he didn't really get he didn't get the goal because we obviously uh, lost the game without scoring but also he didn't really have that much impact on the game and he came on for MacArthur played in a more attacking role than MacArthur was played more or less as a striker but because he came on such late in the game didn't really have that much impact and in terms of Ruben Loftus cheek he came on for Wilfred Zaha I'll give him a six because I thought that in terms of coming on a pitch and making an impact he certainly done that he gave us fresh legs going forward so unlike Zaha who was fading towards the end of the game brought on Ruben Loftus cheek that injection of pace and that fitness made it a slight impact to the game you know he almost scored the win later on where like I said already Venano missed the open goal when Ruben Loftus cheek ran through on goal flashed the effort or shot whatever you want to call it flashed that just wide but in terms of that coming off the bench he actually created a chance which we hadn't done beforehand and he was quite unlucky that a he didn't score and b that Venano didn't get get on the end of the cross and then you know he was quite unlucky with that and like I said already he nearly didn't make the winner so I've given him a six and in terms of because he's before if you compare it to the other team I've given Venano and Slot fives because of their performances but Ruben Loftus-Cheek came onto the pitch and gave something that them two players in particular didn't give throughout the game and that's why I've given him a six but I personally thought that having seen and having debated and I personally thought you don't change a winning side so I thought we keep the same side but having seen their performance at the weekend I personally think that it's time for Ruben Loftus-Cheek who looks to be fit now play a little bit against Bristol City bring him back into the side and even though we're not Barcelona, why not play a false nine system? Because he's got the attributes to not only play up front, but to connect the midfield and the attack. So I don't see why in the games coming forward, he could play there in that sort of more attacking role while we wait for Benteke to come back from injury. But in terms of just to go and overall over the game, you know, it was a really disappointing result and it was quite a big week. We could have, you know, got six points moving up the table. Ultimately, ultimately we didn't. And considering we were the better team, we did deserve to at least get a point from this game. And in terms of what I've already spoken about, Young Kabai, he could have seen red and that could have altered the game. So he could have gone on to lose 3-0. Kabai stayed on the pitch, which I personally think was fair. I think it was a fair, not a fair challenge, but not a red card challenge. Obviously, that, that stopped the game from panning out in terms of Newcastle completely dominating. And we were quite guilty. So although we did dominate and that doesn't necessarily mean you should win a game, but when you dominate, you need to make sure you take your chances. And that's something that we've done quite a lot this season where we haven't taken our chances. If you look at the Burnley game as an example, we dominated the game, had loads of shots, had loads of possession, but we didn't take our chances. So in this game, it would have been an even better result. It could have been a draw. We could have gone on to win if we had taken our chances from the domination we had throughout the game. And that probably could have seen us take all three points, if even if not that, even take the one point from the game. But regardless of the result, obviously I'm not going to try and make excuses up, but there are good things and positives to take from the result. You know, since Roy Hodgson's come in, take away the Newcastle, uh, sorry not Newcastle, the Manchester games, we've seen an improvement. So there's actually a visible improvement now in terms of the way the team is playing and it seems that he's now got himself settled in, he's starting, his sort of methods are starting to work on the team. But now we need to make sure that when we're, when, obviously as the fans watching, we want to make sure now that Roy Hodgson gets it pinpoint week in week out because although we're seeing an improvement we're not getting the results so what we need to do now is continue to see an improvement from the team and hopefully in the next few weeks with us playing well like we've been doing dominating games and with us now actually taking our chances hopefully better results are to come for us in the coming weeks Now to move on to my Man of the Match award, but before I do that I give you my Man of the Match and who I thought the biggest influence on the game, and now I'm going to give you the nominations I put forward for the award. So now although we did lose the game and I don't often, and most people accounts, don't often do a Man of the Match award when they do lose the game, I still think that from this game, although we lost, we did deserve at the, at the very least a point from the game and certainly certain players did play their part in what was quite an organised and hard working display and when you play as well as we did obviously we weren't fantastic but when when you play as an organized unit and you're hard working you will probably expect to at least get a point from this game and looking back at the game obviously I'll go on to talk about the free plays in particular I thought but when you play this well you at least deserve something from the game because when you play so well you expect to do something from the game but do comment below with your man of the match if you if any if you think any plays do deserve it 
But the four, the three nominations I put forward were Scott Dan, Luka Milivojevic and Andros Townsend. Now in terms of being organised and hard working, these three players in particular done exactly that. Scott Dan, I gave him a 7 in the player ratings. He was very solid defensively, making blocks, making tackles. And unlike last season, I thought he commanded the side really well. So he'd done that captain's role really well. Milivojevic playing in the midfield, he broke up play really well. He gave cover to the back line really well. And in terms of going forward and controlling the midfield, he'd done that really well with a, with a few, you know, overhead passes and crosses and things like that so he he not only did dominate the game defensively but dominated the midfield in terms of going forward as well and in Landris Townsend I gave him a seven as well in the player ratings I thought he bossed the game he was our best attacking threat throughout the game kept putting balls into the box kept trying to at least get something from the game and when you consider he was getting booed left right and center he let he didn't let that distract him it almost spurred him on and his performance was even though he was getting criticism his performance seemed to excelled uh, excelled under that pressure but in terms of these three players other than that I can't really pick out any key players in particular who I thought had really really good games they were really fantastic they really they were the players who would have made us win the game but in terms of these three players they stood out to me because I thought that if the whole team had been better so say for example Venano and Slop had been playing better than they were maybe with them players playing better then the whole team and especially these players in particular would have gone on and actually used their organization and hard working display they could use that to actually finally get forth and get the result but in terms of my man of the match i think for me i'm probably going to have to give it to milovojevic so congratulations luka you don't get a trophy or certificate but in terms of your performance i would have given it to andrew townsend but i just think you know the thing i go by is a game is won and lost in the midfield and i thought that luka's performance was was very good defensively but when you consider we lost the game and it was quite it was quite heartbreaking quite like quite horrible to watch and the fact that you played so well and then lose the game and it was only these three players who stood out to me so i could have given the man of match award to any three of these players and i probably would have given it to townsend but in terms of them winning the midfield battle and being part of this defensive performance which was so good up until the goal we conceded i'm gonna to have to give it to milovojevic so now you've heard my match report, player rankings and my man of the match. That concludes this week's podcast. Now I've got an exclusive interview with Roy Hodgson, Andros Townsend and Joe Ward following the game. Andros, thank you for talking to us. Um, what's the emotions like in that dressing room now? Um, obviously everyone's gutted. Um, we came with a game plan. Uh, I think it worked to a T. But uh, to get undone by a set piece is obviously difficult to take. Um, but there's football. And again, win, lose or draw, you, uh, after the game's done, you have to dash yourself on, off and move on. Massive element of luck as well with that goal. If, if you see the replay, James heads it onto the back of his head and then it loops over. Is that maybe it sometimes with you guys, that the luck just isn't going your way? Yeah, but you can't complain because uh, our first goal last weekend was the same as a ricochet. So you get some and you don't get some. We're not going to complain about that. Um, I thought both sides... Didn't deserve to win the game. Uh, there weren't re many clear-cut chances, um, so I think the, the game deserved the draw. But it's one of those things we need to defend uh, until the end, and unfortunately, uh, we didn't today. There's a moment just before the half an hour mark with Johan Kabay. Is he arguably lucky to have stayed on the pitch, or was it overreaction? Um, I can't comment because I haven't had the, uh, the luxury of watching it again. But to the naked eye. Looked like a yellow card to me. I think the referee made a good decision, but again, uh, I haven't seen it back, so I can't. Don't hold me to that comment. But no, I thought the referee made the right decision on that occasion. So frustration at the moment. Two games in quick succession for you now in the League Cup and the Premier League as well. Are you feeling that you're almost there? Yeah, of course. Um, I think we had the fantastic result last weekend, and then to come away from home uh, against a good side who have set, set out really well to almost get a point out of the game. Uh, we're moving in the right direction, but. Unfortunately, today wasn't our day. Uh, we dust ourselves down. We've got a, uh, a call down tomorrow and then we go again for Tuesday. Joe, unfortunately, a defeat today, but the team definitely controlled the game up until that goal. So are there positives to take? Yeah, I think there, there are positives to take from the game. I think collectively we were solid and we limited their chances. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a pill to swallow the way the, the goal was, um, the way their goal was scored. It's an unchanged lineup. Is it good for you as part of a back four to have a bit of consistency? There's been a lot of chopping and changing this season because of injuries. Yeah, that, for sure. I think the longer you uh, go on and, and 
play together, the the more you know each other, the more um, you kind of gel as well. Um, and I think you know we 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 played we played well in the last few games um, and been unfortunate and in 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 this game today especially. Um, but we we've kind of held obviously Chelsea last week and and these for the majority of the game as well. What do you think the difference was between the two sides today? I don't think there was much in it, to be honest with you. Um, I don't think they really created um, too many opportunities. And, you know, for large periods of the game, we, we, I think we, we were the better team. Um, it's just unfortunate the way it's, we, we've conceded. Um, you know, it's, I've not seen many goals like that. That's a bit of a shock to, uh, and, and, and obviously, like I said, a bit of a pill to swallow. We've got West Ham next week. Obviously, they're close to us in the table. But is, at this time of the year, are you looking at other results and the league table? Is it just taking one game at a time? Um, exactly what you said. It's taking one game at a time, uh, keeping our heads down, keeping focused, putting hard work in on training on the training field, and you know that will um, reflect on the pitch, and, and and that will get us the results that we need. Roy, so close to a clean sheet and a point today. What did you make of your team's performance? I thought it was good. I thought we played well for me. First minute to the last. I think it was desperately unlucky that we didn't get at least one point from the game. I think, quite honestly, that there were large periods of the game where I thought we were so clearly in control and passing the ball well and looking dangerous. I think I would have considered myself at nil-nil to have been unlucky not to have won it. To lose it is an even bigger body blow. It happens to you in football, but I certainly can't fault the players today on a their commitment, their their desire to win the game and the way they went about trying to win the game. But a corner kick so late in the game and a fortunate header really because it was headed by James MacArthur against uh, Marino beats us and we, we go away with nothing. You limited them to a few chances before that goal. Are you pleased with the organisation defensively? Yeah, I was pleased with the defensive organisation and the attacking organisation because I think we were very dangerous throughout. Um, you know, people these days talk about shots on target. I'm, I'm often more worried not about the long distance shots on target, which any goalkeeper would save. I'm worried about those balls that uh, zip across the six yard box and people are within a centimetre of tying them into the goal. We had many opportunities like that. So I think that it, I'm more than satisfied in terms of the play, but bitterly disappointed, of course, that we've got nothing to show for it. We've got two, team, two games coming up fairly quickly. Bristol City first this week. Do you expect to make some changes for that? Yes, I think we will. I mean, I'm hopefully not wholesale changes, but we've got a lot of very good players on the bench that, you know, are first team players, basically, or have been first team players and have lost their place in the team because I've chosen others. It will give me a great opportunity to put those in the team and, and give them a chance to, to prove to me that they've been as good, if not better, than the ones I've chosen. Um, but I mean, I'm, I'm still determined that we will take a very strong team down to Bristol and we'll be working very hard and trying very hard to win the game um, because at the moment there's a, a good group of players here that haven't had a chance to show what they can do and they deserve it. So there you have it, now you've heard what Roy Hodgson, Andrew Towson and Joe Ward had to say after the game. That concludes this week's podcast for the game against Newcastle. But make sure to come back next week for a post-match review of the game against Bristol City. So thanks for listening and remember to up the palace.